we're on uh, page 12, and uh, Bill has been through two treatments. The first one, he came out with a good dose of information. He had some self-knowledge, the physical allergy, the uh, mental obsession stuff was given to him by Silkworth. Stayed sober for a while, couldn't stay sober. Second time in, um, he uh, overheard a conversation with his doctor and his wife, and the doctor was telling her that he was either going to die in withdrawals or uh, end up in the psych ward in a diaper. And uh, that scared the hell out of Bill. So now he had a two-phase program, self-knowledge and fear, and uh, that enabled him to stay sober for a while. And uh, then he got drunk again. And now he's drinking, and his buddy, Ebby, has visited him and is, has explained to him that he's had a whole new experience. He got into the Oxford group, and he hasn't drank for a couple months. And uh, Bill's having this conversation with Ebby while he's drinking, and uh, he's getting uh, having quite an experience, and he's believing what Ebby's telling him. And it's, it's uh, putting him in front of a lot of his prejudices. Just for some background, uh, Ebby was in the Oxford group, and if, if you look in Dr. Bob's story, you don't have to turn to this. It's in the back of your book, uh, Dr. Bob's story. They had a six-step program they took guys through before they had written this book. Step one was complete deflation. That's one through nine for us. Two, dependence and guidance from a higher power. Morning meditation was a huge part of their deal. And uh, what they would do, um, they had a little buzz phrase they used when they'd run into each other. Um, and they'd say, are you max today? And that meant, are you maximum for, at the maximum level for God today? So the idea was to pray and meditate in the morning and, get, and pray and meditate until you get guidance for what you're supposed to do today. Then call a couple people and check your guidance out. Okay? Moral inventory was the third piece. That's our fourth step, our tenth step, our eleventh step. Uh, their fourth step was confession. We do that in the fifth step. Five was restitution. We do that in eight and nine. And then six was continue to work with other alcoholics. So that was the basic outline of what they were doing based on uh, what they had copped from the Oxford group. So when Ebby came up with this idea, why don't you choose your own conception of God, it was not an Oxford group principle. They were based in a, in a, in a Christian-based proposition, which was to win lives over for Christ, period. And uh, Roland Hazard got in there and kind of screwed it up and they started getting guys sober using this. So uh, Bill's having this experience, and Ebby lays this uh, question on him. Why don't you choose your own conception of God? We're on page 12. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered for many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. And when I started this, I was an atheist. And I didn't do the steps 2 through 12 because I didn't believe in God. And uh, I read step 2 is you have to believe in God. It says came to believe, which is the past tense. In time, you will come to have a belief. So to get over on the second step, the only requirement is to be willing to believe in the possibility that there's a power, a constructive power greater than me. We all have examples of negative powers greater than us. But when we turn that dog around and we say, well, I've got to find a po positive power, a constructive power greater than me, then right away the alcoholism, the ego says, well, that's a wimpy idea. That's a spineless idea. We don't need anybody. We're fine. So I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon the foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. Thus I was convinced this is Bill. Thus I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. While he's drinking, he's having this experience. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted. There's the need and want piece. God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly those within myself. Remember Bill's mantra? I'd proved to the world at last that I was somebody. Money, power, prestige. I'm on my way. And so it had been ever since. How blind I'd been. At the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Third treatment. 
Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirium tremens. Okay, so now he's in his third treatment, and he's got the information he got from Silkworth. You have a physical allergy. That's our theory. This phenomenon of cravings present only in your, in you, and you're, by the way, hopeless in our eyes. And uh, he's got this experience from Ebby. You know, it's just the necessity is just to be willing to believe in the possibility of this power. And obviously there's a power because he knew Ebby, and that example had depth and weight, and he knew Ebby was on a different basis. He was sourcing something different. Remember, the metaphor was his roots, his roots grasped new soil. He was founded in a whole different set of principles. It wasn't just that he wasn't drinking. He was coming from a different place. So at the hospital, I was separated. Yep. So here's what Bill does. There I humbly offered myself to God, as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly on his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing, that without him I was lost. He did the first three steps. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away. He did an inventory. And then that take them away part is six and seven. Root and branch. I have not had a drink since. He did not say, I've been happy and I've never had a problem since. He said, I've not had a drink since. My schoolmate visited me. Abby checks up on him. I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. He did a fifth step. We made a list of the people I had hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Eight and nine, restitution. Never was I to be critical of them, new attitude. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. In other words, when you're sitting around thinking about what you should be doing, probably doing the opposite would be the right move. I was to sit quietly when in doubt. Here's the 11th step. Asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. That's a big statement. I would have the pieces, the elements. I would have the tools. And a way of living which I would be able to address anything that happened to me. Implied in that is successfully. Implied in that is without having a drink. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were essential requirements. Simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. He uses a lot of synonyms for God in this book. And uh, you'll come up with your own too. It really doesn't matter. A lot of us that have a lot of uh, religious prejudice can't use the word God. Just, it's too hard. It just brings up too much crap. We have to find a new word. That's why they say get a new conception. Because the conception you come here with is a conception that has failed you. If you have a religious background and the dogma and theology that goes with that, you know, you're, you're cooked. You have a relationship to that power and you resent that power, that power is vengeful, wrathful, um, judgmental, you're not going to turn your will and your life over the care of that. There's no trust. There's no trust. So how long does it take to do the steps? Looks like Bill did it coming out of his third treatment. In principle, in principle, he did it. And he had an experience. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up, as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Now he's describing his spiritual experience. He's having an experience of the power. 
For a moment, I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I were still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. Finally, he shook his head saying, Something has happened to you I don't understand, but you'd better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. The good doctor now sees many men who have such experiences. He knows they're real. So he called Silkworth. This is the perfect guy to have in this position. Because any other doctor probably would have said, you know, Bill, you're just suffering from withdrawals and hallucinations. We'll get a little Demerol in here and we'll take the edge off this and you'll be fine. He didn't say that. He said, man, whatever you've got going, hang on to that. I don't understand it, but it's obviously powerful. You're having an experience. Go for it. He supported it. Think how different it would have been if he wouldn't have. He probably wouldn't be sitting here. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, in turn, might work with others. One of the definitions of miracle is any shift in perception. Bill has gone from a totally self-absorbed, self-centered, self-reliant person, edit, to this. This is a radically different thought for him. There might be thousands of people out there just like me who are dying to have this message. Huh. My friend, Ebby, had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating, acting out these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. Now, for the guys that like formulas, here's one. If you want to perfect and enlarge your spiritual life, it's through work and self-sacrifice for others. And that's not just alcoholics. The work is trying to create a consciousness, trying to create unity with the power. And the self-sacrifice is taking time out of your life, which is the only gift you have to give, and placing someone else's need as a priority. That's self-sacrifice. It's not convenient to do this for me. It's not convenient at all. Um, I'm moving my house and my business this month. <laughs> anyway, it's not convenient. And I'm, I'm using it as an example. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm hip to why I'm here. I know what I'm doing here. But it's almost never convenient. You fill your calendar up with commitments, and you think, oh, that's fine. i got nothing going on in August. You get to August, you've committed three weeks to this place, and you find out you're moving your house and your business. Damn. My inclination is to call and say, get someone else. I don't want to do this. I'm busy. But I've been trained, and I know from my experience, that I'm supposed to show up. So I show up, and the first day I'm here, I run into a guy that I was supposed to 12-step a few weeks ago. <laughs> and he's sitting here. He's sitting here with me. What is that? Coincidence? I think not. I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that every person in this room is here. What we do with it is our own business. But I don't think there are any coincidences. So, Bill says, I need to perfect my spiritual condition to survive the trials and low spots that are going to come. Those are two different things. We all know what low spots are. The trials are, I believe, for me the trials are, success. It's a challenge when things really start hitting on all cylinders. It's a challenge to keep doing this because you think there's you don't feel the need, you don't feel the necessity. You're thinking, God, this is working great. Everything is, my life is running well. I think I'll just back off a little bit. That's not the deal. And I'm not talking about just meetings. I'm talking about being present for other alcoholics. That's one of the great traps they give you in this AA thing, they say you're supposed to work with other drunks. It keeps you in the game. You know, it's been a long time since I drank, but when I sit with a new guy and I go back to when I was like him, I refeel it. 
and it gives me a deeper appreciation for how far I've been brought. You know, you're walking around thinking you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day. You know, you got to move your house. Oh, you have a house? you got to move your business. Oh, you have a business. You have a business to move. Isn't that interesting, you know? And I'm coming back from my meeting. We go out to fellowship Monday nights afterwards, and I'm and I'm thinking about all this stuff. Can I just take in this little inventory, you know? Because there's a part of my head that always wants to tell me how bad I've got it and how tough things are. And I turn the corner. It's 930 at night. There's a guy and his wife with four kids waiting for a bus on the corner. And they were not having a good time. It didn't look like they were having a good time. Kids are crying. Everyone's sweating. It's hot. And I'm thinking, yeah, interesting. You know, when I got here, I could put everything I owned in an oak trunk. That's how I moved. I just threw the trunk in the back of the truck and took off. So um, outside blessings, inside blessings. So Bill's having this experience. My wife and I abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping others, other alcoholics, to a solution to their problems. It was fortunate for my old business associates remained skeptical for a year and a half, during which I found little work. I was not too well at the time. I was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times... I've gone to my old hospital in despair. On talking to a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It's a design for living that works in rough going. Now, just a minute. Just a page before, Bill's having a profound experience of God. Where the hell did that go? Now, in the next page, he wants to kill himself. And he's depressed. And he's full of resentment. What is that? Well, Bill didn't know how to sustain his experience. Because all of this was brand new stuff. It was all cutting edge. You couldn't call someone up and say, hey, how are you doing with the God thing? It just wasn't happening. It wasn't available. So he didn't know what was going on, and and he had a problem. He had problems with self-pity and resentment. So then he describes what he did to do that. He said, I'd go down to the hospital, and I'd ask Silky to talk to a drunk. He didn't say I waited for the phone to ring and asked for someone to have someone ask me for help. He didn't say he was even invited. He went down there and said, give me a drunk to talk to. And he went down and he talked to the drunk. And he was amazing to lift it up. He didn't say it did any good for the drunk. But he got the gift. When I give to you, I'm relieved of thinking about me. When I give you two hours in the morning here, I'm not in my shit. I am relieved of the bondage of self. And I get to have an experience of God working through me, feeling the power, witnessing the power. And also I get to experience <coughs> pieces of my journey and my path. So it's, it's rejuvenating. When we get down to it, the only thing I have to give you is my time. And my time is my life. This time will never be recaptured again. This time is gone. When we're done with it, it's never going to happen again. It can't be recreated or recaptured. It can't be anything. It's gone. So it's a high honor. It's a high honor when someone sits down with you and gives you their life. That's a big gift. I didn't see that for years. Guys have been doing that with me all along, and I'm eh, whatever, jerk, you know. So it's a design. It's a plan. It works in rough going. We commence to make many fast friends and a fellowship has grown up among us, of which it's a wonderful thing to feel apart. The joy of living we really have, even under pressure and difficulty. I've seen hundreds of families set their feet in the path that really goes somewhere. I've seen the most impossible domestic situations righted, feuds and bitterness of all sorts wiped out. I've seen men come out of asylums and resume a vital place in their lives, of their families and communities. Business and professional men have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of trouble and misery which has not been overcome among us. In one western city and its environs, there are 1,000 of us in our families. We meet frequently so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek. That's the purpose of the meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to have a place when you walk in where the solution is present. And if you want it, 
We're there to hand it to you and walk you through it. That's the purpose of the meeting. In the beginning, you go to save your ass. But after your ass is saved, you got to give something back. I can't be going to meetings for 28 years because I need a meeting. I need to make my commitment real. And that's to be there for drunks. The best place to find suffering alcoholics is in an AA meeting. Because most of them ain't doing anything. They're just sitting in chairs. So, at these informal gatherings, one may often see from 50 to 200 persons. We're growing in numbers and power. An alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with him are variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see our way of life. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose someone would be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity. But just underneath, there's a deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. Most of us feel we need no look no further for utopia for we have it with us right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. That simple conversation between Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith is a demonstration of the power of ideas. What we think is causal. That's why when you get in your inventory, they stress so much about resentment and fear. These emotions create events and circumstances in our lives. So we have to be really conscious of what we're thinking. Because what you're thinking will inevitably turn into what you're doing. All action is born in thought. It might take a while, but it'll happen. So there's a solution. Chapter 2. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They've solved the drink problem. Big statement. You know, it's, it's... it's interesting how our minds work because we're talking about all this recovery crap and we forget the greatest miracle of all is the one that happened first, the cessation of drinking. None of this stuff can happen until that happens. And we forget. We talk about incurable, fatal, progressive illness, you know, but we don't act like that. We act like we've always got another chance. We do not always have another chance. You always have another chance in AA. You can come back and we'll work with you forever. But you don't always have another chance with your life. That's not our decision. The idea that I can come back again is a ridiculous idea. Because you just can't possibly know that. And I bet every single person in this room knows someone who's dead from drinking or using drugs. And we watch that and go, man, poor son of a bitch. Ooh, that's sad. That's really sad. We had a guy in our in our Monday meeting a number of years ago that was just too smart for all this. And he thought it was really trite. And he went out and got drunk, really good and drunk. And he ran into a grandpa and killed a grandpa and three grandchildren going down a one way the wrong direction. They went, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. It was a tragedy. And it was totally preventable was totally preventable but he was unteachable and if you sit in these rooms and you're unteachable you won't stay and if you don't stay the only thing you can do is drink it's the only option you're going to have because that's the only thing you got in your kit your survival kit here's a pipe, here's a bag here's a bottle maybe a knife, a gun We're average Americans. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. Look around. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. (laughs) We're like the passages of a great liner of the moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. This reference was placed here because this was around the time of the Titanic and the Lusitania. So there was a great cultural significance to this this uh, metaphor they used because everybody knew what they were talking about. Um, 
Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement which binds us. So when we get here, the thing we identify with is our bottoms, the common peril, what got us here. And we trade each other our stories. Okay? But that in itself would never have held us together as we're now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. Every one of us in the fellowship of AA, the people who codified their experience into this book, that us, mm -hmm, they have found, discovered a common solution, a way in which they absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. An illness of this sort, and we've come to believe in an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness, for with it there goes annihilation of all the things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding. Here's an inventory for you on your relationships. Brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. That's a tough thing to get in front of. One of my, uh, one of my personal anthems was, I'm not hurting anyone but me. That is utter nonsense. Everybody that was in my life was affected. Everybody who came in contact with me was affected and got some on them. If you were unfortunate enough to love me and be on my inner circle, you got it the most. Because the people that love us are the most painful for us to be with. And we push them away the hardest. Because we feel so undeserving and unlovable and dirty and so much a failure to have someone keep repeatedly sitting in front of you and go, I love you. You know, what do you need? Let me help. It's just painful. It hurts to be in front of that. And then, you know, <coughs> lie, cheat, steal. Oh. We hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are or may be affected. There are many. So they're saying, you know, if you're non-alcoholic, read this. Understand, one of the things they do at the family program here, and one of the things I do with the guys that I work with, if they have a, a spouse or a family member or a parent or a girlfriend, um, I take them through the doctor's opinion. And I say, here's what you're up against. So I suggest you get to al -Anon. You know, and I can, I can hook you up with some good, strong al -Anon people, but, you know, your goose is cooked. This is why you can't have any effect on this guy. Example. Let's, uh, let's say uh, we're talking about a parent, you know, and little Johnny. I've, I've worked with family members out here, and our, our little Johnny's in here. And little Johnny's like 38, you know. So it's, <laughs> little Johnny's 38, and he's in his sixth treatment, and uh, we really hope he gets it this time. Yeah, you love Johnny, don't you? I, we love our son so much, right? Yeah, we do. Now, you've loved Johnny all his life. You loved him when he wasn't drinking. You loved him when he started drinking. You've helped him, haven't you? We've helped him. We've done everything. We've mortgaged our house. We've paid for treatments. We've, we've loved him to pieces. Yes, you have. And he's 38. From the time you loved him in the beginning to now, has his condition improved? The answer is always no. So even though you love him, your love is not powerful enough to overcome what's killing him. So you can't help him. You can't help him. You're powerless over his alcoholism, just like he is. He can help him and you can help you. But you can't help him. In fact, you're helping him might be enabling him to do this longer. So, highly competent psychiatrists who've dealt with us have found it sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss his situation without reserve. No kidding. Strangely enough, wives, parents, and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do the psychiatrist and the doctor. 
The doctors don't like us because we never tell them the truth. Or we just tell them the convenient parts of it. They can't work with us because we don't want to be worked with. That's why. Or we'll play them and go, oh, yeah, I got a lot of issues. I got some family of origin stuff. And I, and I would like something to help me sleep. Yeah, that'd be nice. You know, and we just start that routine. And we don't get better. We get worse. But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with the facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. This is echoing the thing in the doctor's opinion that these alcoholics, when they meet someone, the message has got to have depth and weight. I don't know about you, but I was not very teachable at all. And I sure wasn't going to listen to a non-alcoholic tell me about my drinking. But when I sat with a guy and he described my insides without knowing me, that was impactful. That was powerful. It didn't necessarily make me do anything different. But when you have the experience of identification with a guy, you're never the same again. It just is irritating as hell because you start understanding intuitively, damn it, there's an option for me. I wonder why I'm not taking it. Oh, because I'm different. That's what your head says. You're different. And different will kill you here. Being different will kill you here. The more andas after your name, the harder it's going to be. You know, I'm sick. I need help. That's a really nice place to start. So look for that identification when you get out of here and you're trying to get hooked up in the community if you do, and you try and find one of these sponsor animals. You know, that won't be necessarily someone you like, but it'll be someone that you're convinced has got this thing dialed in and they're doing it. And that is hope. That's the rope. And I need to go to that guy. I've never liked any of my sponsors. You know, I've, you know, but I've respected them. And I would much rather have a guy respect me than like me because I'm not a buddy guy. You know, when I sponsor you, we're, it, we, we're not going to coffee, we're not going fishing, and we're not shooting pool. We're going to try and save your pathetic ass. That's what my business is. That's why I was adamant about going over last Monday. I'm much more interested in helping you save your life than whether there's adequate time for chores. You know, and that might sound like an asshole thing to you, but that's my priority. I'm here to be effective in helping you have this text come alive for you so you maybe have a shot at a new life. So if our breaks run long, our sessions run long. It's that simple. You know, if you got a 40-minute chore, then leave. If you got a 30-minute chore, then leave. But we're going to do our work. <coughs> so, anyway, I digress. That the man who's making the approach has had the same difficulty. He obviously knows what he's talking about. That his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he's a man with a real answer. He has no attitude of holier than thou. Nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful. You know, no fees to pay, no access to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. You know, why on earth would a guy come out here and do this for three weeks? I don't get a toaster. I don't get a cut. There must be a reason I'm doing this. It sure isn't because all of you love me so much. You know what I'm saying? That's not the deal. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. We feel that the elimination of our drinking is but a beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. All of us spend much of our time, spare time, in the sort of effort which we're going to describe. A few are fortunate enough to be so situated they can give nearly all the time to the work. Yeah, the guys that are unemployable. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> but look at this. You know, we just, all we had was a doctor's opinion. We hear a drunk story. 
And now the other thing, there's a solution. We're on page 19, and they're saying, we feel the elimination of drinking is just the beginning. I thought that was the whole deal. God, didn't you? You've been hearing for years. You got a drinking problem. You got a drinking problem. You got a, I'm, I even started thinking, ah, I got a drinking problem. I got a drink. Fine, I'm not drinking. I got no problem. Ho ho. Welcome to the dance. I got no problem. We feel the elimination is the start of the journey. I thought it was the destination. No, no. A much more important demonstration, acting out of our principles, lies before us where? At home, at work, and everywhere else. Not just in your silly meeting an hour a week. Anyone can do that. Anyone can go sound okay for an hour. It's what do you do in the other 23? Well, I'm sleeping 22. <laughs> so i got to put in one good 60-minute period. No, they're saying this is about demonstrating the principles that you base yourself on. We've been doing this all along. The principles have been selfish and self-centered, and we've been demonstrating those in all our affairs. Now they're saying, we got some recovery principles for you to try and demonstrate. Take this thing everywhere. Don't just do it in AA. Don't just do it with your sponsor and your little sober buddies at the coffee shop. Do it everywhere. <clears throat> if we keep on the way we're going, there's little doubt that much good will result. But the surface of the problem would hardly be scratched. Those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that close by hundreds are dropping into oblivion every day. Many could recover if they had the opportunity we've enjoyed. How then should we present that which has been so freely given us? We've concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. We shall bring to task our combined experience and knowledge. This should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. So if you're anyone and you're concerned with a drinking problem, there's useful information in the book. Of necessity, there will have to be discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware these matters are, from their very nature, controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or argument. We shall do our utmost to achieve that ideal. Most of us sense that real tolerance of other people's shortcomings, new attitude, and viewpoints, and a respect for their opinions, our attitudes, our approaches, which make us more useful to others. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. How do I be a servant? How do I try and make everyone's day a little better that I come in contact, make their way a little easier? And it's tricky stuff, because you can do that from a sick place, too. You can do that from a manipulative place. And when you do, it won't be effective. So you'll find out by trial and error when you're really doing it and when you're pretending to do it. You may already have asked yourself, why does it always become so very ill from drinking? <laughs> Doubtless you're curious to discover how and why, in the face of expert opinions to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. That's the evidence of this book. The people that put this book together were the ones that had been thrown on the, on the pile. They're hopeless. There's nothing we can do for them. But here they are, not just sober, but they're living transformed lives. They've totally transcended where they were at, and they're totally different people. That's powerful. If you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? If you're not asking, what do I have to do? You may be thinking about, how can I drink a little bit and do this? Or how can I get the hell out of this room? Um, the best way is to leave. To get up and say, I'm not doing this. Get the hell out. Get your money back. And go do what you're going to do. It's the purpose of the book to answer such questions specifically. We shall tell you what we have done. Huh. We shall tell you what we have done, not what you will do, not what we theorize, not what we do if we were better people. We'll just tell you what we've done. Before going into a detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times have people said to this, to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. 
His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him, and there he is all lit up again. I should think he'd stop for her sake. If you're here for someone else's sake, it's going to be very difficult for you. You have to be here for your sake. You might have gotten here under circumstances that weren't of your choosing. But now that you're here, if you want this thing, do it for you. Because you can't do it for someone else. You can't do it for someone else. And the next line about the doctor told him if he were drinking again, he'd be dead. There he is all drunk again. Same thing. You can't scare one of us straight. You can't. Because the override is, I need a drink. And that is so powerful an idea that there is no consequence great enough to get me not to take that drink. Might stop me for a little bit, like Bill with the fear. Might stop me for a little bit, but I can't stay stopped. That's the bottom line. I can't stay stopped. Even when I want to, now I can't stay stopped. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance, not stupidity. Ignorance is lack of information. And misunderstanding, we see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. They just don't understand because they don't have our experience when they run into alcohol. They don't get it. It's not in their experience. It's not that they're bad people or stupid. They just don't get it. That's why you're not going to get sober on their behalf. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. So that's none of us. There are a certain type of hard drinker. May have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. May cause him to die a few years before his time, like 20, 30 years. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, warning the doctor, wife says any more of this and you're out of here, you'll never see your kids again, becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. Damn it. I had a father-in-law like that. He was an Air Force guy and he was a hospital administrator and he was a drunk and a speed freak. And finally they got in his face and said, you can't do this anymore. You can't do this anymore. He went through treatment, and he stopped. Well, he didn't really stop, but he moderated. I mean, he had this bottle of whiskey out in the garage. He wasn't allowed to drink in the house. And every couple days, he'd go out and have a pull. That was it. And he's been doing that for, I don't know, 20-some years. And it's like, nah, man, I experienced I can't even imagine. Why would you do that? That's To me, that's alcohol abuse. That's torture. What about the real alcoholic? Ah, may start off as a moderate drinker. Probably all of us were moderate a little bit at one time. May or may not become a continuous hard drinker, so you don't have to drink every day. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. That's the question you got to answer. Is that me? What does that mean? That means I start to drink with one plan and I end up changing the plan, and I just keep drinking. That may not happen every time. It didn't happen with me every time in the beginning. There were times I could I could say I'm stopping for a beer and a burger, and that's what I did. There were other times I stopped for a beer and a burger, and I never get to the burger. And I closed the place. I didn't know. I just thought I was kind of going with the flow. So do I have that experience? I begin to lose control of how much I drink or how often. Here's a fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. He's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's seldom mildly intoxicated. Check. He's always more or less insanely drunk. By whose standard? (laughs) Right? It wasn't insanely drunk to me. It was just enough drunk. You know, and not quite enough drunk most of the time. But to the observer, the non-alcoholic observer, insanely drunk. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. And you have this personality change they're talking about? Such a nice guy, he starts to drink, he just turns into an asshole. 
You guys have that experience? I went from being a quiet, introverted guy to being an extroverted guy. And I saw the personality change in me was positive. You know, I became more of the things I wanted to be when I drank in the beginning. But later on, I just became this doom and gloom machine. And I was loaded all the time. There was a number of years that I was, I'm sure I never drew a sober breath. I wasn't falling down drunk. But I drank all the time because I could not not drink all the time, one. And two, it was the only thing that, that was happening for me. And I was just a jerk 24-7, just an ugly, nasty son of a bitch to be around. They called it intense. That's, <laughs> that's what they would do. They said, you're rather intense. Yes, yes, I am. I am rather intense. You know, that was, that was my deal. I'm a little intense. <laughs> Maybe one of the finest fellows in the world. Let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly, even dangerously antisocial. Now, we read that line, and it doesn't even occur to us. A normal person can't drink for a day. They mean drink for a day. We know what that means. That means get up and start drinking and drink till you can't drink anymore. All day, all weekend, all week, drink for a day. A normal moderate drinker could not drink for a day. They could drink for a couple of hours. We can drink for a day. Nice. As a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. He's often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. Now, I don't know about that. But in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish. They were not saying that about me. He's so sensible. He's so well-balanced in the rest of his life. You know, I was just a tornado. I was out of whack everywhere. Often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes. Has a promising career ahead of him. Uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself. Then he pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. He's the fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock round, yet early the next morning he searches madly for the bodily misplaced the night before. Um, this idea of, this works without, with or without a family, but this idea of building up a bright future, and then pulling the structure down on our head by a senseless series of sprees. We talked about the uh, external referral thing and getting the picture right. And the other thing we do is we sabotage ourselves. You know, I'm doing so well, I'm doing so well, I'm doing so well. And then in the back of your head, that voice starts, yeah, and it's not going to last. It's not going to last. You ain't, you ain't going to be able to pull this off. And pretty soon, something hits, you get a bump in the road, one of those low spots, and you, get, you hear the ah, screw it voice, and you're off again. It doesn't seem like you even thought about it. But you did. You thought about it a lot. So, if he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw it on the waste pipe. Interesting. We got any bottle hiders here? You know, I heard a talk by a woman. This was so funny because I lived alone. I lived alone, and I had bottles hidden all over my place. And I, I heard her talk about this, and I thought, God, that's so stupid. I never hid my bottle. Then I realized I had bottles stashed everywhere. I had them, one in my boot in the closet. I had them under cushions. I had them everywhere. And I thought the reason was I didn't, I wasn't worried about anyone throwing it away. I was worried about you coming over and drinking it. So I had the bottle for you to see, right, the one that sat on the refrigerator. And maybe there's some beer in the fridge, and we'd drink it. I go, God, we're out. I'm... One of us ought to go get some more, <laughs> you know, and I'd send you down to buy some more booze because we drank all of mine and I'd have my stash. So are you, a, are you a hider? Yeah. As matters grow worse, like they're not bad enough, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative, if he's lucky, and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Then comes the day when he simply can't make it and gets drunk all over again. We're chemists. I don't know about you, but I mixed and matched as much as I could, because I didn't know, but I was just so damn desperate. And when alcohol quit working, I brought drugs back into the scene to modulate that. Because I was trying to recreate an experience I had when it was working. And I thought, you know, it must be scotch, must be gin, must be tequila, it must be something wrong with this thing. Maybe I need a little coke with that. Maybe I need a little pot with that. Maybe I need some barbiturates. Maybe I need some ups, some downs, some sideways, some hallucinogens, something. Because I need to have an experience that I'm not having. 
So this isn't a surprise at all. You know, as matters grow worse, I begin to start combining things to make it through the day. His, his example is, is so I can get to work, but it's just to make it through the day. And then the day comes when I just simply can't do it anymore, and I explode. It just goes up. <clears throat> Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine <laughs> or some sedative with which to taper off. I'd like a little morphine to do some tapering. What do you think, Doc? Oh, you seem like a good candidate for some morphine. Yeah, right away. I'll taper on morphine any day. God, those were the days, eh? Mm. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. This is why guys like Silkworth and the medical community were so down on drunks. Because by the time we showed up for help, we were already gone. We were beyond help. Most of us were beyond physical rehabilitation, just couldn't make the curve, couldn't stop. And they couldn't give us what we needed to stop, so they regarded us as hopeless. And we were until we had this text. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic, as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. So, are you in here anywhere? That's the question. Are you in here anywhere? And I'll tell you this right now. Non-alcoholics don't identify with any of this. They go, you guys must be crazy. Precisely. Precisely. We're nuts. So if you identify with some of that, chances are you're in the right room. If you identify with none of that, again, you're in the wrong room. If you don't identify with it, if you don't have to tell me or anyone else. Tell you, is this me? Is any of this stuff me? Because if it is, your ass is in deep doo-doo. You're in big, big trouble. Why does he behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water ring? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respects to other matters? Well, Perhaps there will never be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why, I just lost my place, uh, as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We're not sure why. Once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We can't answer the riddle. So they don't care about the why. It's like your ass is in the ditch. We don't care how you got in the ditch. Isn't it more important to get you out of the ditch? Worry about the why later. Let's get you out of the ditch. We know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens, both in the bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. Do I have that experience? (coughs) When I drink... Something happens. My thinking changes. My body has a different different reaction. See, that's tricky because it's the only reaction my body ever had. My body never didn't like alcohol. It couldn't always get it what it wanted when it was 15, but it never, never didn't like alcohol. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than his body. Hello? Page 23. Just a couple pages ago, they said we feel that your cessation of drinking is the beginning. And now they're saying, therefore, the main problem centers in your mind, in your thinking, rather than your body. The physical allergy, the phenomenon of craving, is not a problem until the alcohol is in my system. Everything that precedes that drink going in is mental obsession. It's all head work. It's all ideas, thought forms, conceptions. It's all thinking. And they're saying that's the main problem. They just answered the question, why can't the guy stay sober? Because my brain won't let me be sober. I got very few ways of coping with you and them and it. And when the heat gets high enough, I just go for a break. 
and my break is booze. I just have to have a drink. I'm not thinking I have to have all the booze in the world. I'm just thinking I need a drink. It's like this <laughs> this alcoholic crawling through the desert, and he stumbles on this this vase, and he rubs it, and this genie appears and says, you can have uh, two wishes, two wishes. And, he, and he's died of thirst. He says, well, I like a bottle of whiskey that never goes dry. No problem. <laughs> There's the whiskey, and he takes a drink, and it fills up, and he takes a drink, and he fills up, takes a drink, and he fills up. He's oh, this is great. She says, what about the second wish? He says, I have another bottle just like this. <laughs> That's the way we are. That's the way we are. I have another one just like that. Give me that. Yeah, more. I have a disease of more. Give me more. So, if you ask him why he started on that last banner, chances are he will offer you any one of 100 alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of a man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so he can't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning, this false reasoning, to the attention of the alcoholic, he'll laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. you got problems drinking, so your solution to that problem is you're drinking more. That's the hammer. Because my head says, true, but. And everything after the but is the rationalization. Is the lie I'm setting up for why it's okay. It'll be different this time. I got much more information now. Having come out of the workhorse, work, workhouse, workhorse. <laughs> having come out of the workhouse after a year, I've got a different footing here. And I'm going to control this baby, you know. Uh <laughs> So, once in a while he may tell the truth, and strange, and the truth, strange to say, is usually that he has no more idea why he took the first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts, in your heart, ask yourself, do you really know why you do it? Once this malady has a real hold, they're a baffled lot. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they'll beat the game, but they often suspect they're down for the count. Whistling in the dark. You know, you get to that point where I'm going to die if I drink and I'm going to die if I don't drink. That's a tough spot. God, that's a tough spot. How true it is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends, in a vague way, sense that these drinkers are abnormal. (laughs) What the hell's the matter with you? But everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. Because when a normal person watches us, they think it's a matter of will. Or morals. Apply yourself. Try harder. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. That is such a stupid metaphor. How can you pull yourself up while you're standing in your boot? Think about it. It's a screw in the ground. How true this is, few realize, sorry. The tragic truth is that if a man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost control. There's the question again. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. Have you had that experience? The tragic situation has already arrived in practically every case long before it's suspected. There's a a slogan, and it says, the chains of alcoholism were too soft to be felt till they were too strong to be broken. That's exactly what happens. That's by the time you and I realize we got a problem, we're already beyond our own help. The fact is that most alcoholics re- re- rewind. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. And nowhere in this book will it say you now have the power of choice in drink. Back. It never says that. We've lost it. The ticket has expired. You will never have the power of choice. You can have the power of choice to move towards God. You can have the power of choice to move towards recovery. You can have the power of choice to move towards drinking. But you don't have a choice. If you're going to drink, you're going to drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. Have you had that experience? 
It wasn't. It didn't have to be a week. It could be two or three days, and I would forget how bad I felt. I could forget that promise I made to myself. I'm just taking the week off. I'm not drinking this week. By halfway through that week, I had changed my mind. You know, I had overreacted. I had made a silly promise to myself that was totally unnecessary because I felt fine now. And when I feel fine, I need a drink. So have I had that experience? Inability to sufficiently recall. That's why I work with you, because it helps me recall. What happens when I drink? The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer don't crowd into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they're hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. It'll be different this time. That was that situation. This is a completely different situation. There's a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove, which is an automatic response to danger. If you go to place your hand down on a surface and there's heat coming off it, your, your hand jerks back. You don't have to think. It just jerks back. It's a normal response to the danger. With alcohol, to use the stove analogy, it's like we go, ow. And then we go, ow. We, ow. And then we put it on the burner slowly and go, I think I can handle that. That's what we're doing. I think I can handle What's that smell? I don't smell anything. <laughs> That's your rat. That's your life burning down. Oh, no. What? What are you talking about? No, I'm fine. That's what we're doing with this thing. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way and after the third or fourth pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop with a sixth drink or, this is mine, what's the use? What the hell? Let's go. We're this far. Let's finish, <laughs> you know? When this sort of thinking, thinking, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he's probably placed himself beyond human aid. So they're saying, Roger, if you're identifying to this so far, we're not going to tell you you're alcoholic, but you certainly have alcoholic tendencies, and you're probably already beyond help. And unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations. So many want to stop but can't. We're going to stop there so you can smoke. What time? I got about 9 o'clock. What do you got? Do we have a clock in here? 9 what? 9 one Let's come back in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs>